USA, USA. Did anybody else start to cry during that last part? Is it just me? Is it just me? Oh my gosh. That is amazing. Wow. That is uh, Kyle's band, and they're going to actually be touring in the Middle East this summer. Uh, I'm, I, I'm not making that up. That is absolute. You guys are laughing. They are actually going to be doing some USO tours um, and singing that song and changing the world. So. Um, it's amazing. Well, okay, so it's Western Sunday. This is as good as it gets for me, all right? Uh, you know, I, so I brought my little friend. This is as good as I get Western-wise. Uh, if it sounds, if you think that my voice sounds like uh, I have a cold, I, I don't. It's just a little horse. <laughs> See? I brought that whole thing up just for that <laughs> stupid line right there. Hey, so I want to start off by celebrating some of the companies that make America great. We're going to make this into a little contest. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show some logos. You yell out if you know what it is. Okay, here we go. First company. Nice. Well done. Well done. Here we go. Second one. Pepsi. You notice that's changed just recently. It's just changed. It's a new logo. But there we go. All right. Next one. Taking over the world. Amazon. Here we go. Next one. Microsoft, it's a little harder. It's a little harder. Okay. This one. Oh. Okay. Okay. Who got that? Who got Snapchat? Who didn't get that? Okay. If you got that and you saw somebody raise their hand that didn't get them, just tell them they're old. Okay. <laughs> just tell them. And honestly, I didn't know either. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have got it except I picked them. All right. Okay. Next one. Ah, uh, yes. Lovely. Lovely. Making us all fatter. Here we go. Do you know that that is the number one most recognizable corporate logo in the world right there? McDonald's is seven, uh, Pepsi's five, number one right there, most recognized. Of course, the most recognized logo in the world is the cross. Thank you, Jesus. All right, but as far as logos go. So each of these companies, they put a lot of money and time and effort to uh, not only create these logos, but get us to recognize these logos. But there's another part of each company. Not only do they have a logo, which is their image, portion. But they also have a vision statement 
for each one. And I, I just want to read you some of them. I'm going to start off with McDonald's. You tell me if you think that they're, they're hitting their mark. Okay, McDonald's vision is to be the world's best quick service restaurant experience. Uh, being the best means providing outstanding quality service, cleanliness, and value so that we make every customer in every restaurant smile. Okay, you think they're doing that? Is that anybody? Yes? No? Maybe? So? Uh, I'm not usually smiling. I'm usually, I'm usually hiding so that people don't notice me ordering, you know, I don't, none of my friends see me ordering my filet of fish. That's usually, that's usually where I'm at. Okay, um, Amazon's vision is to be the Earth's most customer-centric company to build a place where people can come to find and discover anything they might want to buy online. Do you think that's Amazon? Yeah, that's pretty much true. I, I have proof for it. Here's some of the things that you can buy on Amazon right now. Okay, right here. This is the Wall Monkeys Bitten Bologna Sandwich on White Bread Peel and Stick Wall Decal. You can have that and stick that on your room. Why? I don't know, but you can do it. Okay, here's another, here's another great one. This is for your uh, Christmas tree. The December Diamonds Officer Ripped Merman Ornament. <laughs> 37 bucks for that. Put that on your tree. <laughs> All right. Who's in? Who's in? Yeah? Okay, next one. You can buy cereal marshmallows, just the marshmallows, in eight pounds of bulk. Eight pounds of those little things. Wow. Wow. Okay, Here, here's the and one last one. I probably shouldn't show this. You, can buy a, you know that you can buy a casket on Amazon? Crazy. I don't know. I don't know. All right, Walmart, to help people save money so that they can live better. Do you think they're doing that? Do you, this is, do you think this guy, you know, he's a Walmart shopper. You think he's, he's living better? Now, listen. Okay, got yeah, one more. One more, and that is Nike's. Nike's for a time, it's no longer this. This isn't their vision statement. For a time, their vision statement was two words, and it was crush Reebok. So there are two parts of each of these companies. The, there's the image part, and then there's the vision part, or the image part, and the actions part. And if you think about it, this is us as well. There's an image part of us. There's the what we show other people, and what we look like, and what we dress like, and what we drive, and what our makeup looks like, and what our hair looks like. There's that. And then there's the actions, and who we are, by our actions and what we actually do. Every company has it, every person has it. You have image and you have actions. Let me ask you, which one is most important? Now, I don't believe that if I was sitting across from you at Starbucks and we were having this conversation, I don't believe there's a person in this room that would tell me that their image is more important. But based on the amount of time we spend, that that might be true of us, right? But actions, without question, we all would agree that our actions and who we are and what we do and how we treat the people around us and, and what we do with our life is way more important than our image. Folks, we're in this series called Love Does because love doesn't talk about it. Love doesn't just have some good ideas. Love doesn't say, hey, I'll pray for you and then never does anything. Love does. Love makes a difference. Love grabs that person's hand and says, let me pray with you right now. Love brings over chicken soup when somebody's sick. Love goes down and feeds the homeless. Love goes to Belize. Who went to Belize? How was it? Oh, that sounds tired, man. That... <laughs> Love gets up and takes their family and goes to a third world country to make a difference in the world because love isn't image. Love is action. Now, we've been looking at this guy, Nehemiah, and Nehemiah lived this. And so if you have your Bible, why don't you grab it? I'm going to give you a little background if you haven't been here for the last couple of weeks. Nehemiah had a vision, and his vision was simply this, is to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. They'd been fallen for 140 years. He had a friend go visit Jerusalem, come back. He said, what happened? What's going on? He says, all the walls are broken down. And Nehemiah literally sat on the ground and cried his eyes out. His heart was broken. And in that moment, God gave him a vision. God put the vision statement in Nehemiah's heart. I got to go make a difference. So he goes and he goes and talks to the king. He risked his life, really, to talk to the king. And the king says, yeah, you can go. Not only will, you get, will I let you go, I'm going to provide all your supplies. 
We pick up the story in Nehemiah 2, verse 11, and it starts like this. So Nehemiah is ready to go. He's got his supplies. I went to Jerusalem. And after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. He had his buddies around him. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding. Okay, why don't you underline this line, all right? Underline this line. God had put, I had not told anyone what God had put in my heart to do. What God put in my heart to do, that's his vision. That's the central focus of his life. This is the most important line of this chapter. It might be the most important line of this whole book because this was Nehemiah's call on his life. It's what broke his heart. Let me ask you something. What is that to you? You know, our youth is in here today. Maybe you haven't figured out what your vision is. Maybe you're just at this place where you're going, God, what is it you want me to do with my life? Maybe that's where you need to start today. Some of you might have an idea. You know, I want to help people. I want to make a difference. I want to raise a really good family. Uh, I, I want to maybe go on a mission someday. Or maybe it's just beginning. Maybe you need to pray, God, make that clear. And some of you know. Um, I'm looking over at my friend Rachel Kulapitas. Her sister knows. Christiana Kulapitas has gone on so many mission trips with Canyon Springs. It's in her blood. She knows. She wants to change the world through missions. I know there are other people who are changing the world in Mexico here. And, and some of you, some of you, your heart's desire is to change your family. You remember what it was like growing up in your family of origin, and it wasn't great. And your call in your life is if you can do anything, it's just to change that history so that yours is a good, positive history and you pour into those kids' lives. My call is what is your vision? Is it time to start forgetting about that image that you have and start getting to work? So let's do this. Why don't, you, why don't we start like this? Why don't you bow your heads? And why don't you just say, God, what is it? Or maybe you know what it is. God, give me the courage to do it. Just ask God, what is that vision? What is that thing that breaks my heart that you want me to do? And give me some wisdom on how to do that today. God, I pray that you'd use us today. I pray that you'd speak to us. There's so many different people, so many different par parts of their life, some beginning, some middle, some, you know, finishing up, different visions. God, the only way to use this morning is if you speak to us. And so we're asking that your spirit would flow through this place, that you would speak, that you would clear our minds, that you would give us a vision for what you want us to do. But God, be in this place and make us different people. In your name we pray, amen. All right, I want to read that verse again. I want you to notice, we're just going to start in, in right where we're at, uh, Nehemiah 2, verse 11 and 12. I want you to notice two things about it. See if anything strikes you weird about this. First off, I set out during the night with a few others. I hadn't told anyone what my God had put in my heart for me to do in Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me uh, except the one I was riding on. Okay, first off, who was riding the horse? Nehemiah was. Man, if you're a leader... You ride the horse. I like that. Uh, secondly, they're walking around. He's on his horse. He's got his friends. But do they have any idea what's going on? They have no idea what's going on. They're just wandering around with him. He doesn't even give them any clue what's going on. It seems strange to me. Does it seem strange to you? Okay, we're going to talk about that in a second. But as we continue to read these verses, we're going to find out how to make your vision a reality. Whatever that is in your heart, how to make it real. And we're going to do that by looking at the life of Nehemiah. So the first thing we're going to find out is your life vision begins by simply checking it out. Just checking it out. You don't have to do anything. You, you don't have to, you know, if you're, you got all, lots of people have lots of different visions. I want to go back to school. I want to get my master's degree. Uh, I want to get married. I want to raise a family. Uh, I want to find that perfect mate and get married. That's your big goal in your life. Or I want to start a business. 
All kinds of people have different visions in their life. And sometimes it's so big that you can't get started. You know, how, what am I, how am I supposed to, you know, just get a graduate degree? How am I supposed to start a business? Where am I going to meet a guy? You know, all the guys at my work are ugly. What, what, how, is this, how is this even going to happen? Look, you don't have to begin by doing it. All you have to begin is by checking it out. You know, call up the school. Find out what it takes to get that graduate degree. How much it's going to cost. What classes you have to take. How long is it going to take. When those classes are offered. That's a step. That's all you have to do. Um, Starting a business, you start to look at some classes on, in, uh, you know, on being an entrepreneurial leader. You get some books. You read what other people have read. You look in the area you're interested in. You just research it. You want to date a guy? You look up eHarmony. <laughs> What's it cost? Does it work? That's all you have to do. That's what Nehemiah is doing in this moment. And that's what really we're challenging you to do. If you just want, if you're interested in helping out with the church or making a difference in the world, if you look on our outreach page on the Canyon Springs Street, you look in ministries, look in our outreach page, we have nine different ways that you can get involved and do some things. And we're going to talk about one of those in just a moment. But all you have to do is research it. Now look at verse 13. This is what Nehemiah does. By night, I went through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down in its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved toward the fountain gate at the king's pool, and there was not enough room for the mount to get through. So I went up to the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back, re-entered through the valley gate. The officials didn't know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as of yet, I hadn't said anything to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or officials or any other who would be doing the work. Um, let me explain. He's, he's on his horse. He's looking around at all the different places where it fell. And he looks. There's the valley gate. This is the valley gate that opened up to the valley of Hinnom. Uh, there's the fountain gate, which opens up to the pool of Siloa. Um, then he goes to the dung gate. Um, do you want me to describe the dung gate? Any guesses out there? Let me just say real estate was cheap there, all right? Um, he's wandering around. Doesn't tell anybody. He's simply checking it out. You know what? I think there's great freedom in this. Because God puts something on your heart and you don't feel like you know what to do. You don't feel like you're ready. All you have to do is research it. Nobody even has to know. You just get your iPad, Google it, figure it out. I just had lunch with a buddy this last week. I gave a message a couple months ago about moving to a better seat. You know, a lot of people feel like they're not seeing God work. And the reason why I don't think you're seeing God work is because your seat's not close enough. I can promise you, everybody that went to Belize got a front row seat, and you saw God do amazing things because you got yourself into that seat. Uh, or, or, you know, my friend Randy who goes to see homeless, he sees God work all the time. There, God does things in our children's ministry all the time for those Sunday school teachers because they're on the front row. John's wearing his Awana shirt. John sees things happen at Awana every week with kids' lives because he has a front row seat. So my buddy calls me and says, hey, I want to I know how to have a front row seat. So we got together at Board and Brew, and you know what I told him? I didn't tell him that you should sign up and serve in children's ministry, or you should serve in our youth ministry, or you should go on a mission trip. I simply told him to check it out, because that's your first step. And it was great. We had a good conversation, and he bought my Tricado. It was awesome. Love it. You know who's great at this in my family? He was the best at this in my family. It's not me. I'm kind of more of a jump in and ask questions later person. It's my son. About a year ago, he decided, hey, I'm thinking about going to law school. And so he researched it as, be as best as I've ever witnessed anybody. First off, he researched taking the LSAT, which is the entrance exam to take the law degree. He found out that taking a class would help him get a higher score, so he spent his money to take a class. He took the, the test 13 different times before he took it once. And then he just started to meet with different lawyers and different judges and different professors. And if there was any lawyer that he knew, he would meet with them. And if any judge he knew, he would meet with them. Just anybody in this whole field. And he found out where they went to school and what kind of legal work that they did and you know, what their favorite lawyer joke was. He found out everything. Do um, you want to know what my favorite lawyer joke is? OK, here it is. Um, so this attorney was with this guy that uh, had been accused of a horrible crime. 
He says, hey, I got good news and bad news. And the guy says, well, well, okay, so what's the bad news? He says, well, they found your blood all over the crime scene, and they did the DNA test, and it's yours. Okay, so it's pretty obvious that you did it. He says, okay, so what's the good news? He says, well, they tested your blood. Your cholesterol is 115. So, <laughs> so that's my favorite lawyer joke. And that's not even that good, is it? <laughs> he met with all these different people and asked all these different questions. And I finally asked him, I said, Riley, I'm so impressed that you're doing this. He says, Dad, this is a no-brainer, man. I meet with these people for lunch. They pay for my lunch. It's, you know, like father, like son, right? <laughs> Listen, God's placed something in your heart. All you have to do at this point is research it. What would it take? What would this look like? Now, let me give you the second step in making your vision happen. Your life vision is solidified by sharing it with others. Verse 17, he finally tells them. He says, then I said, you see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. We will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. He finally invites him in. He says, look, this is what happened. I went to the king. I asked his permission. He gave me all this stuff. Let's rebuild the wall. And they're in. Your vision can't really take root until you tell somebody. A couple years back, uh, I had an elder board team, and I read this book called The Dream Manager, uh, The Dream Manager by Matthew Kelly. And it's a really short book. It's about 100 pages. It's about this one manager who helps not only his people do their work, but also to realize their dreams. And the goal of this book is to write down your top 100 dreams. It's a really good practice uh, because if you write them out, you are more likely to reach them. And after we went through this book, I met with each of my board members and I asked them what their dreams were. And one of the guys was named Charlie. And Charlie had the dream to hike up Half Dome and do it in one day. Now, that's 17 miles up and back. That's a long way. A lot of work to do in one day. And he had always hoped to do it, but never actually did it. But when he put it on paper, and I sat down and I asked him, hey, are you going to do this? He was in. And I still remember the day that he hiked up Half Dome. He did it on a Sunday. Uh, you know, didn't approve of that. Um, but... <laughs> He was hiking while we were in church. And so we called him up to chant to him, go, Charlie, go, Charlie, as he was hiking up Half Dome. And he went up and down and did it and sent me the pictures. It was awesome because he, he expressed it. It became real. Still a really bad reason to miss church, in my opinion. Listen, you have a vision. Let it out. Let people hear it. That's how it becomes real. Now, let's get back to this part. Okay, so he, he, he does all of this. He finally tells his friends, why did he wait so long? Why do you think he waited so long to tell people this great big vision? I think we get an answer in verse 19. Ready? But when Sanballat the Hornite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshon the Aaron heard about it, when they heard about my plan... They mocked and they ridiculed us. What is this you're doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? And I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We're his servants. We'll start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. Listen, I think this is why he waited. Because I can let me make you this promise. If you have a vision, you want to make a difference in the world, you want to change it, you want to do something big, somebody somewhere thinks you're an idiot. <coughs> somebody somewhere thinks you can't do it. Somebody somewhere will criticize you. Am I right? You know, it's so funny, I gave this message in first service. I've never seen more heads bob than when I made that point. Because these people have lived it. It's just reality. Uh, let me read you this. I don't know who Oliver Emberton is, but he put it like this. And let me paraphrase. If you aren't ticking someone off, you probably aren't doing anything important. <laughs> Meaningful achievements are perversely more likely to annoy the world around you. Are you losing weight? You should be happy with your own body. Saving children in Africa? You should save your own country. 
Curing cancer, what took you so long? Whatever you do, you're going to annoy somebody. He actually has a graph to back it up. Here we go, graph. You look at the top. If you're a famous rock star and president of the earth, you will annoy lots of people. The only way to avoid that is down at the bottom. You're watching kittens on YouTube in your pants, okay? <laughs> the only way to avoid that. A friend of mine, I think it was you, Noreen. I think it was you. You used to put this at the end of your emails, right? Is this, is this the right quote? Did I get it right? Those who say it can't be done shouldn't interrupt those who are doing it. Is that your quote? Yep. That's just the reality of life. If you try to make a difference, if you try to change people, if you try to love people, if you try to embrace people, people will tell you you are doing it wrong. I can guarantee it. But listen, that's the only way you make a difference in the world. And so if people are annoyed with you, good job. <laughs> You're on the right track. So I want to end like this. Um, we've been talking enough theory. Oh, let's talk reality. I want to bring up my friend, Emily Cook, who has put all this into practice, and she's going to make, pull, turn all this message, tie it all together, right, Ems? No problem. All right. <laughs> no pressure. Sure. Let me move my horsey. Thanks. Okay, Emily. So why don't you tell us what was that moment, that, that Nehemiah moment where you, you hear about this and it just breaks your heart. I love that Larry's right there again. That's awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> he never but, moves, does he? No, it's First perfect. service, perfect. second service, Sorry, he's right there. You know when you're here and you're like, where's a friendly face that will smile at me? Okay, um, so <laughs> I... Uh, well, I'm a teacher currently. I work um, in Escondido Union School District, and I teach. Uh, last year, I taught kindergarten, um, and I. Um, this is my first year in the school district, so it kind of starts before that, which was that I was really um, looking for a change in my life and wanting to find the, that thing that broke my heart. And I knew that it had something to do with kids, um, kids that were, you know, growing up in a little tougher situation than the one that I experienced, and so. I was um, really praying for that, for the thing that would break my heart, and I found the perfect job. I, um, so now I'm working in Central School in, in Escondido. And what, I, what people don't know is that I tried to hire Emily on our children's ministry staff, and, and uh, right at the last second, turned me down flat. So I'm forgiving you for that. God had other plans. He did, <laughs> I know. Our, um, and our staff is so system. good. Yeah, right, that's right. So I... Um, yeah, he had other plans for me. So I start, started there this year, and I got involved right away. I, the, one of the first things that I was doing was um, helping with this after-school softball program. And in the coaching of the, so coaching of the softball team, I got to talking to one of the other teachers, and I found out that she had been buying um, out of her own money groceries for one of her students because all the students at my school get fed breakfast and lunch um, daily at school, but then on the weekends and dinner, they don't, not all of them have food to eat. And so she had a particular family that she had been buying for, and she was kind of confiding in me that, you know, that's kind of tough on a teacher's salary to be supporting an additional family. And I um, knew that my small group was looking for ways to help, and so I sent the email to my small, I was like, I think I have a team of people that would like to help you. So I sent my small group an email, and of course, immediately, and from that moment on, I've had bags of groceries, grocery gift cards, like food covered for a family um, at my school. And, and in fact, the good news is that family had a custody like legal switch, and so now they have the money to feed the kids in that particular family. So it was cool to see that wrapped up, but of course there's always other needs. Um, so it started with food for yeah, one family. Okay, yes. and so then where did it go from there? And then I, I started just sort of noticing other things like um, that softball team that I told you about one of the prerequisites was that the kids are supposed to bring their own gloves to play softball. So these are the same kids that don't have food for dinner are supposed to go out to Sports Authority and buy a glove. Right. So, so I, um, by this point, the email list was kind of growing because people were interested in my new job. And I'd tell them a little, and they'd be like, oh, let me know if you ever need anything. And I will let you know. <laughs> so we needed gloves, so we got That's why I pointed out Larry. Larry was awesome and gave us a huge donation of hand-me-down gloves. And... Um, a couple of other people from church and other friends were um, eager to donate. I know you, everybody here probably has an extra baseball glove in their garage that they want to give to Goodwill. And so we took them, and then every kid at our school got gloves that they got to play softball with. So that was awesome. And then the same thing happened with soccer balls and 
Um, other gear hats, oh my gosh, you should see them in their brand new hats that were donated. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's amazing so great. to see. And then clothes. Clothes. My sweet little boy, one of my favorites. Not that I have any favorites. <laughs> um, <laughs> was starting to show up to school with the same clothes every single day. He was wearing the same outfit every day. And so I um, let some of my friends know again, and I got donations for hand-me-down clothes, a couple of um, just people gave me money to go buy him clothes, so I did some work at Target. Real trouble, tough job. Somebody's got to do it. Um, so we were able to get him clothes, and some days I would just switch him. You know, I'd say, okay, you go to the bathroom and change. Bring me the dirty ones, and I'd take them home and wash oh, them and bring so him great. back. Um, so great. You know, so that was really, it was cool to just know that, like, anytime, you know, when you careful what you pray for, anytime you, like, pray, okay, show me a need, it would come up. I'd have a new student the next day that needed something. So, um, so that was kind of how that all it's Awesome. Okay, yeah. so tell us this about this last month. So one of the things that's really cool that I'm seeing firsthand is that our school has a lot of resources. You know, we try really hard to bridge that gap. So the technology that the kids use at school is great, and there are plenty of books, and there are plenty of amazing, caring teachers at my school. So sometimes when we're going off to a break, it's a little hard for the teachers because we know that over summer they're not going to have all of that at home. They're not going to have books or anyone reading to them necessarily or food. So um, I got this little idea about how could we get it so that every kid could bring home a couple of books so that they could have some books at home to read that belong to them. And so I, I had this idea, and I like sort of wanted to ignore it because I didn't have the time to deal with it. <laughs> um, so I sent an email, and I, I basically said that. I was like, I don't have time to do this, but I have this idea. So if anybody has time or can help, let me know. And a bunch of people wrote me back right away, and they were like, yeah, let us know. So I was in that stage of not ready to share the vision yet, <laughs> but in case nobody wrote me back, and then I'd have to let it go until next year, I guess. Um, so at that time, I sent out an email and said that I had two weeks to gather 2,000 books. That way every kid at my school could take home two books for their summer vacation. Um, and okay, was, don't, don't tell them. Don't tell, don't tell them. them. Just let's see them, what, watch the video. All right. Well, check out what happened. <laughs> This summer, can you raise your hand? Me. Whoa! I love it because I can pick five books because they are awesome. Thank you! Isn't that, isn't that amazing? No okay, did you see that, that number? Oh, see that number? 6,000 6, books. books. And what it started really with an email, right? Yeah. Yeah, it started with an email. And I didn't really even do anything. Like, I just brought books back and forth and sent some emails of encouragement. Um, but Don't I, you mean really, you made your husband bring the books? I know. Did you guys see all the Canyon Springs people in that video? Yeah. I mean, it was like, I, didn't, I awesome. had to teach all day. I wasn't even there. It was, it was truly like... I just had an idea. I didn't. I really I can't take any credit except for a couple emails. So. Listen, yeah. you know, all it takes, sometimes it doesn't even take your own vision. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it just takes joining somebody else. You know, if you look on that outreach page, there's eight or nine different things. And half of those people didn't start any of those things. They're just joining somebody else. What is God breaking your heart? Let's not be about image, people. Let's be about actions and what we do. And, and this place can change the world. Okay, so I'm going to make you pray for him. Oh, please. Come on. 
Come on, pray oh, for him, Emily. God. Pray for these people. This is my worst nightmare. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. Oh, God, thank you for, for bringing us all here today to Canyon Springs Church. And um, thank you for the vision of Jack that, that gives us all the encouragement um, to keep moving and taking one step at a time. And God, I ask that you break our hearts and show us um, what you want us to be doing for you every day. And we know that when we are working with you, we're participating with the creator of the earth. And so mm -hmm. we just thank you for that power and ask that you give us um, the courage to pray for our hearts to be broken. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Awesome. That was a good prayer. <laughs> I'm not even was that a good, was that a good prayer? Oh, heaven. All right, folks. So